actually, before I get into that, let's just uh, talk about this. What did you guys think about uh, those two podcasts? Yeah. Um, I knew that, like, Yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is. It's interesting. Next week we're going to be uh, doing, uh, we're revisiting fermented foods in lab. Um, and then later in the semester I'm going to uh, be talking about the digestive tract. And I will talk about the vagus nerve. Um, vagus is related to the word vagrant. It means a wanderer. It's the, it's the wandering nerve. It travels throughout the body, uh, hits a lot of your viscera. And those microbiota interact uh, with the vagus nerve um, and interact with your, your brain. There's a huge concentration of serotonin, the happy, the happy drug that lives uh, in your gut. So happy guts, happy you. It's, it's interesting. Any other thoughts on it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That is a beautiful point. Uh, and you, you follow what she's saying? So what they did there uh, could be a strategy you could use in your own podcast. you got to go for 20 minutes, say. Or one group is kind of doing a – or you two, I guess – are doing a one big podcast, and that would be something that would be a good strategy for that uh, to keep the, the listener's interest, break it up into like 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and 15 minutes. Um, so there's like, yeah, science and human interest, so different things for different listeners, but still kind of driving similar points uh, home. Yeah, history, science, and then, um, and then human interest. Any other thoughts about it? Did anyone struggle listening to the uh, Brains On one? Kind of ridiculous. It was hard for you to listen to that one a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was annoying. It was a little annoying, huh? Um, yeah, Hannah. That's exactly why I chucked it in there. It's exactly the reason I put it. It, it dovetailed with the topic, but that's exactly why. Because it is a little bit, oh, God, I don't really want to listen to this. It's fine. My children, my six-year-old and eight-year-old, they love it. They've listened to that podcast like four times probably. Um, and, you know, they, they love the whole Brains On series. They listen to all those. But they particularly like that one because it's about farts, because they're making ridiculous noises with a tuba because they're telling a story about some guy that can sing with his butthole. I mean, it's hitting that target audience right where it counts. Like my kids would have given that an A++ on that podcast. So that podcast did a really good job of communicating some like, um, you, you may feel like, oh, I didn't really learn a whole lot about you know, the microbiota maybe learned a little bit. May, they did talk about hydrogen sulfide and how uh, your intestines are populated with bacteria. There was a little bit of science in there. For an eight-year-old, that's a huge amount of science. It had a huge amount of science that they could actually remember. My, my son can repeat all of the facts, the actual red meat facts that are in that uh, podcast because it was really appealing. It was presented in a way that was ideally tailored to that uh, audience. Um, so that's that's kind of the like discussion I, I want to get going in the class is um, who is the uh, who is our audience? I don't know. I don't want to tell you who our audience is. I want to to think about that as a group as we're as we're continuing forward. I'm going to meet with you guys all one by one as a groups today uh, in lab, and we'll talk about the specifics of that. But um, does it are there thoughts about that? Uh, now, who, who is our intended audience? Who would you like to um, listen to these podcasts? 
because I, I see this as more than just a, a class activity that you have to do. I want it to be something that's impactful on the world. People could come and listen to these podcasts. I would like that. I want that. I, ideally, if there's good ones, if, if we do if we do our job, I'd like to have them on iTunes, um, you know, so people could just listen to Colby podcasts about, about the biochemistry of foods. Who do you imagine would listen to this? Yeah. I mean, I think it would be really important to, in addition to like our class, to have like a, a podcast that reaches sort of more of a mass audience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're talking about science, but don't make it too scientific, I guess. Or like the the first podcast we listened to, mm -hmm. yes, it's about science and yes, it's about microbes in the gut, but it's about a science that affects us all. Mm -hmm. right. Whereas some podcasts could be about some random molecule that does something boring and perfect for you. No one knows what it does. So I just think that it's important to have um, a science-related podcast, but also has sort of universal appeal. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I really like the story at the end to like try to make it, try to connect it to the personal qualities of those sort of things for a more interesting mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Let me ask you this. Why are you guys in this class? Why why are you here? Does anyone want to? You give me the most cynical answer. I don't care. What, what do you think? Uh, the reason why I'm here is yeah. because like, a lot of this stuff goes on in the class. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, the topic is something that is, is, is relevant to you. you we all eat, and you want to know... What that's doing, how that's affecting us. Who else has an answer to that question? Yeah. Another great thing about a class like this is that um, it, it's supposed to appeal to people who aren't necessarily science majors. And so what's so great about this class is that, yes, you're learning about science, but you're also able or you're learning to apply it to other disciplines, which I think, again, as I just sort of said earlier, it creates like a wider appeal. Any other thoughts? On this, should I put voice to uh, maybe unspoken thought that you have? You're here because the college is making you take this class, right? None of you guys are actual scientists. That's why you're here, right? You're non-science majors. Um, but a liberal arts education says for you to be liberally educated, you need like a, a an educated citizen, like off-the-shelf generic human being in uh, with a liberal arts education here in the United States needs to take some science. You have to be exposed to some science to be an, an, an intelligent, educated human being out there in the world. So as non-scientists, you have to have a basic familiarity with science. That's why we we're making you take a class. Now, you picked this class, as Damon said, because you may be interested in, in food. Um, you know, and, and bravo for all of you taking a class with the term biochemistry in the title, because that can be a little bit intimidating to people. Biochemistry is some pretty serious science, right? Um, but of foods, and that made it more relatable, because we all have to eat. Um, so just like what you were saying, I think it's important to give science, maybe to the non-scientists, give science to the masses so that they can understand and feel a part of this huge realm, this huge impact on our society. Science is such an, uh, an important driver of progress and development. Uh, it has such a, a huge impact on shaping the world that we all live in. And if you're not really um, conversant in uh, fundamental scientific thinking or like the fundamental science that goes into a lot of the, the basic aspects of our lives, then you are on the sidelines. And you certainly... Uh, would have a hard time calling yourself truly liberally educated. Um, so that's kind of how I would hope that you would think about um, the audience that we're trying to reach. You know, somebody who people who are interested, their minds are turned on, they want to learn, they want to participate in our society, and they want some science, but they may not be scientists, right? So a little bit of science, uh, but stories, because that's what compels people, right? Hit them where they live. Okay, that's enough of uh, that. Unless there are any other thoughts, I, I, I'm happy to devote time to it.
No? Okay. Well, we'll spend more time in the lab where we have a, a more open format. I've got stuff I want to chug to. Yeah, Damon. Maybe we would also like just a quick question about why I'm not going to work with mine here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, um, did that, did that, like, just, like, the way they were speaking about it in relation to the cow thing. Well, no, 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 no. No, it's, it's, it's not normal for a cow to have a fistula. A fistula is uh, some kind of pathologic manifestation, meaning it's, like, not normal. Uh, but the cow just sort of deals with it, right? The cow, the, the cows may not, and it seems like they weren't in those cases in pain. I'm not a veterinarian, so I, I, don't, I can't tell you the occurrence of it or a lot of specifics about it. But a fistula is just... Um, it, it's a passageway con connecting two compartments that are not supposed to be connected uh, the way they are connected. And that can happen by a number of reasons. Uh, so with a cow, perhaps it's congenital. They were born with it. Or maybe they had an infection that, that I don't know, scarred them and opened up a fistula somehow. Or maybe um, they had an injury, like the, the guy in Beaumont's thing yeah, sure. who got shot in the gut. Um, and then had a obviously kind of mediocre doctor sewing him up, um, but who, I mean, that, I love the William Beaumont story because it's so ridiculous. I was born in Beaumont Hospital in Detroit, so I've known the story of this guy for a long time, and it, it's always sort of, like, interesting to me that even this, like, kind of mediocre doc who couldn't really sew this guy up the right way, who, like, sewed the outside of his body to the inside of his stomach so there's a window there, like, you know, I, I, I feel like, I don't know, wasn't there, obviously, but, you know, I feel like if I would try to, like, make sure to sew tab A to tab B. Um, but even this guy, who, like, couldn't quite get the sewing together, uh, still was just curious about the world around him. And still, uh, because of that curiosity and, and trying to go about it in a systematic way, was able to, like, work his way into our, into our common consciousness. Um, all right, so right here, this question. I asked you guys to think about this uh, for next, for last time. Uh, we, uh, I showed you that um, as the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes up, plants photosynthesize more rapidly. They're going to put on more carbohydrates. They're going to grow more carbohydrates. We talked about <coughs> photosynthesis a little bit. That's how... They couple the light and the dark reaction. Energy from the sun gets stored in carbon-carbon uh, and carbon-hydrogen bonds in the sugars that we eat. Um, and when there's more carbon dioxide, they photosynthesize more, build more starch, build more cellulose, make more sugar. Um, what do you think? Is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Or is it a mixed thing? So, yeah. We call that eutrophication. Yep. Any other thoughts? No one ha has any. Oh, so, yeah, Damon. Um, so this is, can we just like. Walk yeah. you through that slide? Yeah. Like, okay. All right. Uh, let's see here. This is where the one button studio would have came in handy. I'll just turn this around so you can see what I'm doing. Here. Which I need a power. Uh, power. So right here along this axis, we have concentration of carbon dioxide. So as we go this way, this is the increase in the, in the carbon dioxide concentration in the ambient air around that plant that the plant has access to. And then on the y-axis is uh, simply uh, photosynthesis, and it's the measure of photosynthesis. What grams do they, uh, what, what they, micromoles uh, per meter squared per second. So that's just a unit of looking at the rate of photosynthesis. How rapidly is the plant uh, uh, photosynthesizing, fixing carbon? And as you go up in carbon dioxide, you, as we travel this way, our ability to the rate at which we make uh, sugars, at the rate at which we photosynthesize, is going up. So. Um, here, it, this, like right about here, 
is the um, historic level of CO2, and we're at about here right now, something like that, maybe a little bit more. This is an old, uh, old diagram. Um, but, and then we, I talked about the difference between C3 and C4 plants. Both of them respond similarly, at least, I mean, in broad sense, uh, that they build more carbohydrates uh, with an increased CO2 level. Okay, follow that? Yeah. So, who thinks it's a good thing? It's, oh, yeah, Nick, what? I think, well, I think it might be a good thing just because um, maybe having higher uh, post synthesis levels would be people maybe converting to more plant-based diets, and then in turn, that might start to have the effect of the CO2 rise, which point we have less focus on animal-based diets, and cows, less methane in the atmosphere, so it might end up balancing out. Yeah, so he likes the fact that this is, uh, we're going to be able to grow plants easier, and we s we'll switch over to a more vegetarian-based diet, right? So more people on the planet will be eating vegetables. Come to that. Like, yeah. Um, I just think it's relatively concerning, just because, like, based on that, it looks like like growth vegetables does plateau. You know, so if they if that's the point where they can't, but they just like stop growing faster. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, well, let me put this in context. If our CO two level was here, if that was our CO two level, the or this probably wouldn't be a, a problem because. That's enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that we probably would go past a tipping point and be on a like a chart. Like a rock. It's not what about for C four things? It starts to, it starts to tip much yeah, longer. yeah. It, it does it does level off uh, sooner. We're getting towards the maximum of the C four plant. Uh, yeah. So you're you're saying potentially a negative thing because uh, even though it's increasing, we may be hitting the maximum. Yeah, and then it's just, then it's just like more carbon dioxide in the place. You can't put the thing where you can control things by the future. There's no concern. You guys think about that? So kind of like the Haber-Bosch problem is what you're saying. So for all this nitrogen into the atmosphere, into the ecosystem, be able to produce all this food, but then the humans overgrow. So you're worried about. She's worried about population overgrowth. You're worried about the capacity for plants to continue to grow like that. Uh, and which is a little bit different than you. And your concern remind me once again once. I was just thinking that it might be a good thing for plants to. Oh, and you like the fact that it might push it towards vegetarianism. Uh, what was your thought? Oh, you just wanted to know the yeah. dynamic. Yeah. Any other thoughts over here from this side of the class? <coughs> um, that is, I can think about that, the fact that they cross. We're not at that point of equivalence yet. Um, you know, probably not, especially since you can't, I would say. Yeah, so C4, their ability to photosynthesize is not the biggest uh, distinction between the two of them. The way they use water is the biggest distinction, and the temperature range that they're functional in is the biggest distinction uh, between the two of them. Uh, and then the thing that I talked about was also their the ability to segregate isomers, but they're their base ability to focus the rate of photosynthesis probably is not. Maybe, though, maybe uh, that might affect the, the isotope distribution between carbon 13, carbon 12 fractionation between the two. And being able to, like the hair experiment we're going to do, uh, that may be less of a thing, um, less noticeable, although that may not be true. Any other? This might be a dumb question, but. No. Does the amount of like carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere affect how much sunlight we come through and how much how well plants are photosynthesized? Um so <coughs> the thing that blocks what's called photosynthetically active radiation or PAR, um, it 
uh, is ozone. Um, ozone, as the light's coming in, ozone uh, <coughs> picks it up and reflects it back out. Um, but the, uh, the light is, is pretty much able to penetrate through the carbon dioxide and methane. I don't imagine that PAR uh, is, the, like, PAR intensity is dramatically influenced by carbon dioxide to the point where it would be a so that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if anyone knows. Yeah. Um, you're talking about photosynthesis? Yeah, as temperature goes up, rate of photosynthesis would go down. Uh, we're going to talk about that, uh, how that actually, what that actually means. Uh, but what happens as it goes down, uh, water evaporates more rapidly, you're dehydrating the environment, and then eventually you're just too hot to go. Too hot to go. So what's the, what's that? Uh, I don't know. This is just a qualitative thing. I don't, I don't know. That. And it certainly would be different from C3 and C4, and it's probably different from species to species, uh, plant. So that, that's just a very qualitative thing. Uh, and then light intensity, uh, plateaus the ability to, to have all right, well, let me, um, before I, I do that, let, let's vote. Let's vote. Who thinks, uh, just in broad terms, this is uh, a good thing? We've heard some suggestions why it may be good, some uh, that thinks it may be bad, and some who will be mixed. Let's say, first, a uh, good thing. Who thinks it's a good thing? Two, three people, you're on the fence. Who thinks it's going to be a good thing? Okay. Uh, who thinks it's going to be a bad thing? So that's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, most of the class. And then does anyone think it, it's mixed? A couple. So three. Okay. Well, I'm not going to answer the question as to whether it's good or bad in general, in such uh, general terms, if you were looking for that from me. But uh, I will tell you about uh, this guy. So, uh, Irakli Lalzads, Lul, I don't know how to say that. I wish I did. Lalzads, whatever. Um, this guy first start. he, he uh, became aware of an observation that um, carbon dioxide levels affect the rate of photosynthesis in seaweed. All right, but it also affects uh, the protein content in seaweed um, and, the, tra and the, the presence of uh, trace elements. And he began to wonder whether this is true in the food we eat. It, uh, so this whole, uh, f the, the whole field of determining the elemental composition of an organism, like when I had you guys uh, tell me what <coughs> elements humans were made of, that is the field of uh, ionomics. It's called the ionomics of something, the elements that somebody is, some organism is made up of. And uh, he found that, uh, the, that the level of CO2 has a profound impact on the ionomics of various plants, that they're, the levels of certain elements in uh, plants is getting radically depressed. Uh, in the presence of higher carbon dioxide. So when there's more carbon dioxide, uh, there's more carbon in the plant, but a significantly less amount of uh, potassium, calcium, all these smaller elements, but also, importantly, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium. I talked about the red field ratio, didn't I? So it's throwing the red field ratio off. And uh, we're going to get into nitrogen next week. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about proteins and, and amino acids uh, as an extension of what we initially discussed in terms of nitrogen. Um, nitrogen is way down. So if nitrogen is way down in the various plants that this guy was looking at, what does that mean? Yeah, specifically what's not good about it. So 
Thank you. Yeah, there's not as much uh, nitrogen incorporation. And if there's not as much nitrogen absorption or assimilation, those are all synonyms, um, then you're going to have less protein. The protein content of the foods, the vegetables that we eat, is getting reduced. Our food is becoming less nutritious for us because of increased carbon dioxide. All right. So uh, this isn't just uh, here. This is so. Here is uh, a, a figure from a study that he published in 2014 um, that uh, shows that it's a global phenomenon. Um, so if you look on the right hand side, you'll see that the zero along the x-axis you see is zero, and then uh, to the left are negative values in mean concentrations of these different uh, components of, of food. So across a wide range of uh, C4 plants, um, across a wide range of geographic regions in the world, um, there is a significant reduction in overall uh, in the um, ionome of the plants. Uh, Worldwide. All right, so let's let's keep let's keep hitting this. Um, this was followed up uh, by a big paper that got published by another group in Nature. Uh, so this isn't some fringe uh, work. This is getting published in the very top science journals um, that said that increasing carbon dioxide actually threatens human nutrition. Um, so we're looking at, in this graph, a uh, percent change in the nutrients at elevated carbon dioxide uh, levels relative uh, to the uh, ambient uh, carbon dioxide. So uh, they look at wheat, rice, uh, peas, soybean, maize, and sorghum. So this is C3 grasses, legumes, and C4 grasses. This is uh, three dramatically different uh, categories of food. And a percent change in nutrients, broad, broadly indexed nutrients, um, at these elevated levels of carbon dioxide show a real uh, suppression in the relative amounts of um, these nutrients. So they looked at zinc, iron, protein, and uh, phytate, which is another phytonutrient. All right. So how, how big is this effect projected to be? So what? So what? Um, here's a map uh, from another uh, article that was just published this year, a few months ago, uh, showing the risk of protein deficiency, global protein deficiency, based on uh, projected 2050 uh, population projections. Um, so in the top panel is the, the current percentage of population at risk of protein deficiency. And you can see that uh, most of the people that are starving in the world uh, of protein deficiency live in sub-Saharan Africa or in uh, central, uh, equatorial, uh, central and South America. Um, and however, uh, projecting forward, um, they're showing the percentage of the population that's going to be newly at risk of deficiency under elevated carbon dioxide. Um, and so what do we see here? We see that uh, there are reasonable 2 to 3 uh, percent of the population in India and 1 to 2 percent of the population in China are going to be newly at risk of protein uh, deficiency uh, moving forward. Why is it such a high percentage in India? Why do you think that's such a high percentage, particularly in India? You throw your minds back to, what was it, the first or second day of class? Why isn't there a lot of meat in India? They don't eat cows. They don't eat cows. They're vegetarians. That's a whole country of vegetarians. The whole country of vegetarians is getting their primary protein source from vegetables. Uh, and I already showed you that rice, which is, uh, has gluten in it, which is the, one of the, it's the largest protein source on the planet, 
largest consumed protein source on the planet. Um, this is real, the bottom panel now. Let's translate this from percentages into real people, and this is where it gets bad. Um, what's particularly alarming about India and China is there are a lot of people there. There are a huge number of people there. All right? Um, so greater than 5 million people uh, are estimated to be newly at risk, people that are not at risk now, but will be at risk solely because the food they are eating is not as nutritious as it should be or as it was uh, at the birth of agriculture. Um, this, is a real, this is a real problem uh, that, that your generation is going to be dealing with when you're my age. So it's good that you are some of the few that understand it now out there because I don't think this is a particularly widely appreciated consequence of increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. Um, why isn't it a, uh, a problem, as much of a problem in um, Europe and uh, the United States and Canada? More meat-based diets. Americans eat meat. <clears throat> Europeans eat meat. <coughs> Potentially, uh, yeah, potentially, but and that may lead. I don't know what the effect is. I don't know if they accounted for that in the study. I don't, I, I'm not really sure uh, what their methods were, but um, it's was, a good observation. I was reading something, and I think maybe a potentially a bigger global issue is just the amount of food wastage that happens. And I think I saw that, like. In the U.S., it's like 30% of food that gets produced is, or no, I think in the U.S., 50% of the food produced is wasted, and globally, it's like 30%. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you're looking at numbers as big as those, it, like, I feel like it'd be easy to offset, like, a lower amount of nutrient concentration in foods if we'd started looking more at, like, not wasting so much food mm -hmm. and getting food to people who might be at risk of a deficiency. I love it. Solution-based approach to thinking about the data. I love it. Great. Let's get out there and do it. Yes? This is, these are project, these are real projections that are getting published in top scientific journals. I didn't do the study. Um, I've looked at the data. I'm persuaded by the data. Um, so do I really think it? Yeah, I do. I, I wouldn't be putting it in the class if I wasn't fairly persuaded that this is not fake science here. Yeah, so you will be taking on more calories then, right? And uh, so that could lead to more obesity, which is already a problem globally. Uh, so people are take, being more obese, but undernourished, not having the right uh, nutritional profile. They're not getting enough protein in their diet. This is what this is talking about. This is protein deficiency. This is not bulk calories. And there's only so much food you can fit in your body, right? Um, so before you hit satiety. Uh, and like overeating a food that's nutrient, uh, that's protein def poor, uh, to try to get enough protein, you're, you're going to be taking out more calories than, than you actually need. Uh, I'm not saying that, um, you know, shifting consumption patterns isn't the solution because I think it is the solution, but um, I don't think necessarily just eating more is quite as simple as that. Yeah. Jake? Oh, you're just stretching again? No, I'm Okay. All right. Uh, do I have any other? Yeah, so just the last, uh, the last bit of this here, I'll just, um, this qu question is, even in our government, which is often slow to, to pick up uh, the thread of perceived uh, threats, they're taking it seriously. The USDA is taking it seriously. So here is, um, here is a research facility in, uh, the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center. I actually don't know where. It is, thank you. Um, how'd you know that? You from Maryland? 
Okay, good. Um, well, <clears throat> they're trying to address this. This is the facility that they work at. This guy is uh, one of the lead researchers working on this project. His name's Louis Z uh, Ziska. And um, he, one of the problems here is that um, they wanted to know how the level of protein uh, changed with time outside of the effects of breeding, okay? Because uh, bre selective breeding does affect the genome of, of a strain with time. And so he looked at goldenrod, wild goldenrod, not being bred at all. Okay, and what's interesting about goldenrod is they have uh, seeds of goldenrod that go back a long time. So you can get seeds of goldenrod that have been preserved from the 19th century, the 18th century, uh, throughout the 20th century. There's been there's samples of goldenrod, and so you can look at the compare directly to the historical records. And he found that the uh, protein content has dropped over time in uh, wild in wild, non-hybridized uh, goldenrod uh, due to carbon dioxide uh, increase. And so then they began to, to test this more uh, rigorously with food, and they work in these what are called spar units uh, down there. I've never seen one of these. It would be pretty cool to visit one. But um, So they're tiny little uh, greenhouses that they can control the atmosphere in, all right? And uh, they basically, so here are some peppers that they're growing, and they just, these little discs are pumping carbon dioxide, uh, increased levels of carbon dioxide down on the plant. Um, and they look to see how it affects plant growth. So here's one of the researchers harvesting some bell peppers, and she's going to measure their vitamin C uh, levels. And to give you the uh, bottom line, for example, as, as, uh, protein has been depressed and the, ion, uh, the ionome is depressed, vitamin C levels are also depressed in this. So um, they use these little pho photosynthetic, uh, th these machines that uh, are able to assess photosynthetic uh, activity in the plants and are able to correlate it with nutritive value. So that's what you see here. It's, it's looking at photosynthesis that's happening in, uh, happening in an individual leaf um, that is exposed to these higher levels of, of carbon dioxide. So they are trying to, uh, they're trying to really assess, get some hard information, because it's only become uh, appreciated by the scientific community in the last 10 years. And I promise you that the general population has very little appreciation of this as being a real, uh, as a real threat. To go back, the last point I'll make before I let you out of here, um, and that bottom panel, I, the red is India and China, a lot of people live there. But it, uh, this study estimates in 2017 that one to two million more people, just in the United States, one to two million more people, that's, you know, 0.4% of the population, uh, is at risk of being protein deficient uh, by 2050 because of this effect that we're seeing. So it's a, it's a real issue. Okay, any questions? I think that was all the slides I had.